evening. My name is Paul Murphy. I'm the director of the Institute of Catholic Studies here at John Carroll University. Welcome to the Alumni Lounge in Rodman Hall here on the campus in University Heights. Uh, it's been an odd semester. It's been an odd time for all of us. We miss the presence of our students. We miss the hustle and bustle of a campus on a usual uh, October afternoon and evening. Um, and we look forward to those days when you, uh, either as friends of the university, as alumni, or as students, can join us again on this campus. I'm not wearing a mask now, but while we are proceeding this evening, we will be taking precautions, sitting at a distance, wearing masks. I, it is good to begin once again, therefore, and maintain continuity with our ordinary traditions here. We want to uh, welcome you to the 2020-2021 version of the Catholic Studies Lecture Series. Um, this is an annual event, and this evening's event is the annual Augustine Lecture, which will be addressing an issue that's of great interest to all of us. I wanna thank in particular, the Office of Alumni Relations, Dave Vitito and Eric uh, uh, Eikhoff in particular have helped us gather a number of alumni who are interested and are joining us this evening via Zoom, Zoom which seems to be ever present. Um, and we want to encourage you to ask questions uh, of our speaker when the talk is over. So if you will, I would ask you to submit questions through the question and answer format and button on the Zoom. And then what I'll do is uh, write down the questions and uh, present as many of them as we can to our guest. And we're very fortunate this evening. Our guest is Father James Bretsky of the Department of Theology and Religious Studies here at John Carroll University. Father Bretsky is a native of Milwaukee. He is a former uh, missionary in South Korea. He holds uh, graduate degrees in theology from both Weston School of Theology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and a doctorate in moral theology from the Gregorian University in Rome. He has taught on the West Coast at the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley, at Santa Clara University, the University of San Francisco, Marquette University, Boston College, and now he has finally come home to us at John Carroll, where he has discovered that this is the best of all of those possible places. It is good to have him here. His topic tonight is, is um, about the election that's coming up. This is the Augustine lecture. What might Augustine say? Catholic reflections on the presidential election. Please join me in welcoming Father James Bretsky. So thank you very much, Dr. Murphy, for that kind introduction. Um, it's true, I have come to Cleveland, but in the interest of full disclosure, I have to admit, if not confess, coming from Wisconsin, I am still a Packers fan. Uh, the Cleveland Browns would, of course, be number two. So here is the primary text uh, that I have focused on. It is St. Augustine's magisterial work on his political theology. And really, I would say it's the, the summa or, the, or his most uh, comprehensive view of all of theology. As you can see, it is a relatively thin volume of uh, 716 pages. We won't be treating each and every one of those pages as more or less uh, the highlights. So now I have to... Um, come closer to the computer to share my screen and engage the uh, PowerPoint. And we hope that this part works well. And I have a, I have a mouse that I hope, uh, that I hope also works well. So what might Augustine say about faithful citizenship? from the city of God to the 2020 elections. Faithful citizenship, uh, in case you are not familiar with the term, it refers to the document of the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops that, is, that was a first uh, written in 1976 and has been updated every uh, four years um, 
for the for the elections. So here's a little uh, bio biographical snapshot of Saint Augustine. So he lived uh, in the fourth and the early fifth century, and he was uh, a pagan when he was born. And over time, he became very accomplished as a rhetorician and as a, a as a, a philosopher. And over time, then finally, he converted to Catholicism after the fervent prayers of his uh, mother, Monica. And I think most people know uh, broad outlines of his life. So we're gonna be looking at not so much just the city of God, but we're gonna be looking at his life and his theological context to see if there might be something that we could take from that and use in our own. We are definitely living in interesting times, if not definitely troubled times. In the 2016 election, if you look at the right hand um, uh, snapshot there, we saw uh, that, the, that more people voted for um, Hillary Clinton than for Donald Trump, but that they were surpassed by the people who did not vote at all. So the first point that we might want to make is that faithful citizenship means being responsible as a citizen. So when we talk about what would Augustine say, uh, this is of course a genre that probably owes a lot to the famous expression, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And I think that it is easier to give a negative rather than a positive. It's very hard to say, well, what would Jesus do about the COVID-19 pandemic? But it's easier to say, what would Jesus not do? And so I got there in red letters, would Jesus separate children from parents even if they were seeking asylum? I'm going to go out on a limb there and say, no, I don't think Jesus would do that. So we're going to um, have to see where we go with all of that. I don't think Jesus has a, a policy on immigration or asylum or any of the other major debatable issues in 2020, nor have I been able to find similar policies in Augustine's uh, tome there, The City of God. So to give you some other disclaimers, it's very hard to try to channel Augustine for November 3rd, so I'm not going to try to do that. The corpus of Augustine's work is vast, much more vast than even just that one slim volume. And we don't have enough time or even expertise on my part to do a really deep dive into his uh, work, The City of God. But we are going to try to have to establish some sort of a context for what he's doing so that we might draw something for it. And here's my artistical uh, hermeneutical context. I'm sort of a frustrated art historian. As Dr. Murphy said, I did my doctorate in Rome and I actually taught there also. So I lived for seven years in Rome and this is uh, the chair of Peter. Supposedly it was an old uh, relic of a chair that Peter supposedly sat in. Historians think that that probably is unlikely, but nevertheless, it has come down in tradition as being the cathedra, the chair of the Pope. And it's encased in this rather grand uh, piece of sculpture by Bernini. And it's in the back of St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican City. So if you've been there, you no doubt have seen it. But what I wanted to point out here uh, in terms of decoding this artistic piece here is we have Augustine. Um, I'm gonna see if I can, oops, didn't work. That, I was going to try to use the pointer. Uh, we have Augustine and Ambrose in the front. They're the ones wearing the pointed hats, the bishop's mitres. And in the back, we have two doctors of the church from the Eastern uh, tradition, John Chrysostom and Athanasius. And they are, in a certain sense, providing the foundation for the chair of Peter. They are the key doctors of the church. And the chair of Peter is over the world. And if you look carefully, more or less in the middle, you'll see the little papal tiara. But then above it, 
in what some people think is a clock, but it is not. It's a, it's a window, and we have the Holy Spirit in the, in the um, light there. And the rays of the Holy Spirit, the light of the Holy Spirit, which illumines the world, notice that it is not focused like a laser coming through the papal tiara onto the chair of Peter, but rather it is diffused throughout the whole world. And that, I think, is an important theological point, that the Spirit of God goes where it will. It blows where it will, and the light that comes from God is meant for the whole world and not just one part of it. So let's look at Augustine's theological context. We can look at his theological autobiography, which is expressed, I think, most well in his book, The Confessions. But I want to point out one aspect of that. As a younger man, he was very much fascinated with the theology of uh, Manichaeism. And that divided the world into light and dark, good and evil. It was sort of a cosmological struggle between these two forces. And that, I think, still, it's a heresy. But like many viruses, there's never an, a totally effective vaccine. The best we can aim for is maybe some sort of herd immunity that as you come in contact with it, become infected perhaps, but then get beyond it, that hopefully that heresy will ultimately die out. So I think it's still a little bit with us in the, back, in the background as a dualism that leads to trying to interpret the city of God as being with us in the Roman Catholic Church and the city of, or the earthly city, sometimes it was called the city of man. Augustine never said that himself, but the, the earthly city as being all the others. And that I don't think is true. So if you look at Augustine's confessions, it's really a journey trying to bring himself closer to God and to remove those things that keep him from God. So as he said famously in the, in the confessions, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O God. So let's turn now to the city of God. The, the Latin word civitas, civitas dei, which translates as city of God, the point that I want to bring out here is that civitas means something more than city. Right now we are in University Heights and if we go a block away, we'll be in Shaker Heights. It's not that kind of a municipality but rather it is a community that has important aspects of citizenship, uh, a real constitution that constitutes the community, the Civitas, that presumes a social contract, a social body that is united by law, and that then in this Civitas, we are all meant to be citizens together. The words civility and civilization obviously come from Civitas, and I think that many people have observed that civility seems to be a bit in the decline nowadays. And I would like to suggest that this whole chivitas is really what the bishops are trying to get at with their document, Faithful Citizenship. So here I've got um, a, a, the outline of the city of God. And I only want to point out two points. I've got them out there in yellow. One is that in a big part of the city of God, he goes through in some detail what I am calling the arc of salvation history. So from, from the book of Genesis to the book of the apocalypse or the or revelation, it really is the progress of God's creation through history, ultimately to final completion. And that is when we will be taken up fully into the city of God, but we are not there yet. Now the bishop's faithful citizenship, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a document that has uh, undergone a good deal of change and expansion over the years. In 1976, when Jimmy Carter uh, was running against Gerald Ford, it was 3,000 words, and now I think it's <laughs> approaching 20,000 words. And basically in this expanding document, what the bishops are setting forward here are these primary bullet points. They try to enunciate general moral principles. They stress over and over again that the choice 
of voters and also the choice of politicians exercise primarily the vo virtue of prudence, uh, they, they emphasize too individual conscience so that as informed voters and as informed conscience, we then try to do what we believe God thinks would be best in this or that concrete decision. Character counts along with policy. So it's not policy alone, but character counts. And we'll be turning to that in just a little bit. And in the 2020 election, the last uh, two bullet points here are more of the controversial issues. And I'm going to give an interpretation of that. One is over what is meant by the term preeminent. When the bishops say abortion is the preeminent issue in the 2020 election. So we'll be looking at that. And then they, the document has for years used the term intrinsic evil. As a moral theologian, I can tell you if there's one concept that students find most difficult to understand and interpret correctly, it's intrinsic evil. So I'm gonna to try to uh, briefly uh, take another stab at that. But as St. Augustine would say, what we have to do is take up and read. So is this a good description of the city of God? Now, for those of you that are familiar with the music of the St. Louis Jesuits, you no doubt have heard this song more than once. And Dan Schutte was a Jesuit who was a couple of years ahead of me. And he was what we call in Jesuit lingo, the angel when I entered as a novice. So there were a couple of Jesuits that had already taken vows and tried to guide us through the, uh, the first days of our life as Jesuits. And so he was, in that sense, my angel. And so he wrote this song. And the key line here that I've got in yellow is, let us build the city of God. Now, as a piece of music, I think that this works well. As a piece of theology, with due respect to my, <laughs> my senior, it is not good theology. We do not build the city of God. If you think of the Our Father, it does not say, let us build the kingdom of God. Rather, we pray that God's kingdom come. And so there is a difference. So we are to act and grow in such a way that the city of God will be more, that we can be welcomed into the city of God and that God's kingdom will more completely, fully and quickly come. But we don't build God's kingdom. We don't build God's city. That's the work of God. He hasn't outsourced it. Now, evil is often uh, connected with the so-called earthly city, but can the city of God here and now coexists with this earthly city with evil. Because in Manichaeism, you would try to try to get rid of evil. And uh, that I think is a, is, a, is a task that will never be accomplished. Yes, we can talk about a world without evil in the abstract. And there's a Greek word made up by Thomas More um, that is called utopia which comes from the Greek uh, ou, which means not, and topos, which would mean a place, like topography is writing a map, a place. But there's no place in the real world that is completely without evil, and that's not going to happen in our lifetime or the lifetimes of our great-great-grandchildren either. For Augustine, the expression he used for this was this, this mixed body, this corpus per mixtum, which meant that the church is going to be marked both by holiness, because it is God's church, but also with sin and weakness, because it is made up of men and women. And in moral theology, we have several principles that try to deal with how do you navigate through the topography of a world that also has evil in it. Two of them in particular are of relevance in political uh, discourse the principle of tolerance, and the principle of compromise. And both of these are good and necessary. The principle of tolerance recognizes our limitedness in many real life situations. It doesn't mean giving up and saying, well, do whatever you want. But rather, it recognizes that we do not have the power 
or the wisdom to make the world perfect as we see it. So we have to, in order to avoid greater disharmony and unrest, we have to allow for, a, we have to tolerate a certain amount of discord and maybe even evil. The other principle is the principle of compromise. And this, is, this will be relevant as we'll see in just a little bit. Again, compromise doesn't mean giving up on what you believe is morally required or only going halfway on what you believe is morally required. But it recognizes, to jump a few centuries ahead of Augustine to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, it recognizes that part of, of the natural law is to try to maximize the good and foster that and minimize, if you cannot entirely avoid, the evil. And so at times, compromise will involve our cooperation with evil. Uh, what I usually say in class to students is, how did you get here today? And some of them will drive or take the bus or whatever. I said, in that sense, we are all to some extent compromising with um, carbon emissions, which negatively impact our world. But we say that's legitimate because of the proportionate reason of trying to get to class. Now here's a little piece that deals with this principle of compromise. It's a longer piece that's talking about a practical question. Could a politician support a piece of legislation that would allow for abortion? And it says here in bold, when it's not possible to overturn or completely abrogate a pro-abortion law, an elected official whose absolute personal opposition to procured abortion was well known, licitly supports proposals. Licitly means validly or acceptably, morally okay, aimed at limiting the harm done by such a proposal. So if you had a piece of legislation, for example, that expanded health care, that would strategically limit abortion because when people have expanded health care, the numbers of abortions goes down and social scientists have given great support to that, uh, that factoid. So they said this, isn't this doesn't result in illicit cooperation with evil. So who would say something like that? Now you might say, well, it must be some left-wing liberal Jesuit, uh, but actually it was Pope John Paul II in his magisterial encyclical Evangelium Vitae, The Gospel of Life. He said that in 1995 in paragraph 73. So that's an important example of how compromise can work. And if we bring this over into the ballot box, here you've got, um, I think, a good uh, assertion of a principle. A Catholic would be guilty of formal cooperation in evil. And formal cooperation means sinful, not acceptable. If you were to vote for that person precisely because that person is pro-abortion, and instead of abortion, you can put in any other serious evil. If you wanted to vote for a candidate because you believe he is going to um, torture terrorists, which tortures another intrinsic evil, then if you say, I'm voting for that person because of this, that would be formal cooperation with evil and would not be acceptable in the eyes of the church. But on the other hand, when a Catholic does not share a candidate's stand in favor of abortion or euthanasia or any one of these other things, but votes for the candidate on the basis of the candidate's stand on other life issues, uh, that would be considered proportionate reason. And the vote for the candidate is then considered to be only remote material cooperation and validly uh, allowed. Now, who again would say something like that? Would it be someone like me or perhaps, as was the case, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger when he was the head of the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith? And he said that in a public memorandum to the head of the U.S. Bishops Conference in the June 2004 election when John Kerry was running against George W. Bush. And as I suspect everyone listening knows, uh, 
uh, Cardinal Ratzinger got an upgrade and he became Pope Benedict XVI. Now back to Augustine. So Augustine says, let's talk about one of those toughest things to understand, free will. Why did a good, all-knowing, loving God give free will to creatures he knew likely would abuse it and sin? And so Augustine says God knew that this would happen, but God went ahead and did it anyway, because as the, as the passage continues, God saw that the power of good is greater, more powerful, more enduring than the power of even very malicious evil. And that through this allowing, through this tolerance of this evil, God, with God's grace, is going to bring us all through it and bring us into even a greater collection of people who can be in heaven or in the city of God. And now a word from our sponsor. This was the gospel a couple of days ago. Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? To what can I compare it? And he gives two examples. The mustard seed, which is a pretty small seed, but grows into a great bush. Or a little measure of yeast, which someone mixes in flour, and the yeast permeates the flour and causes it to rise. The point of both metaphors is that they are gentle metaphors. It's not like Jesus is saying, God's kingdom is going to come in on a bulldozer and an urban rehabilitation or renewal project, but rather it's going to be more like yeast or like a very small seed, which over time is going to grow. And I think that that fits in with Augustine's city of God. So here we are, the city of God, voting and holiness. How do we move forward? Now here's, um, here's a, a couple of tweets here. The one on the left, I think honestly is an unfortunate tweet. It's by Bishop Thomas Tobin, not to be confused with Cardinal Joseph Tobin. Cardinal Tobin, Cardinal Tobin is in Newark, New, New Jersey. Bishop Tobin is in Providence, Rhode Island. And he says here, I think sarcastically, because he knows that Joseph Biden uh, is a Catholic. Last Sunday, Joseph Biden was in church. Next Sunday, Joseph Biden likely is going to be in church. And he says, it's sad. The Democrats have no, uh, no Catholic on uh, the ticket this year. And lower down on the, um, on the thread, we have this, uh, this piece here. And, th and that's mostly, it's the right-hand side that I want you to look at. So it, th this person, who I do not know at all, says uh, a Catholic, I have to go closer to this text. A Catholic cannot vote for a candidate who favors a policy promoting an intrinsically evil act such as abortion, full stop, and cites the US Catholic Conference of Bishops. Now, as I've told my students, footnotes are important, but make sure they're correct and complete because here's the part that he's footnoting. And if you look at it, and there in the middle, it says a Catholic cannot vote for a candidate who takes a position in favor of an intrinsic evil, such as abortion. And where that person stopped his tweet, the sentence, in fact, continues on, or racism, if the intent is to support that position. That would be formal cooperation. But if you do not support that position, you, you could vote for the candidate. And in either case, the opposition to abortion or any other intrinsic evil would not justify indifference or overlooking the rest of the important moral issues that face us. Does character count? Well, for Augustine, it clearly did, because here I've got another little quote from Augustine. Humility makes humans like angels and pride makes devils from angels. Remember that Satan's original name was Lucifer, which means the angel of light. And Augustine says, if you want to discover the character of people, just look at what they love. And I think there's a great deal of human wisdom in that. Uh, faithful citizenship takes up this theme in paragraph 37, 
And it says here explicitly that in making our political voting decisions, voters should take into account the candidate's commitments, character, integrity, and ability to influence a given issue. When we turn, in, in, as we will in just a little bit, to the possibility of third party candidates, you might say, well, so-and-so is my ideal candidate. I believe that person's understanding of the issues are the way it should be. And so I'm going to vote for that person or write that person in. Well, okay, you can of course do that, but that person likely is not going to be able to influence that particular issue because their chances of being elected are, are very slim. And so if they're not in government, they're not going to be able to influence it in the same way. So I think we have to really look at a candidate's character, integrity, and commitments. Where are they invested? Not just financially, but where is their life invested? Now, here are some of the issues. Not, it's not a complete list, but it's a reasonable list of issues that are intrinsically evil. Intrinsically evil means that if this is the object of this action, it cannot be justified by saying, well, I've got, I want good intentions with that, or that, well, it's a tough, you know, it's a tough world and we, we have to live in the real world. And so sometimes, you know, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. That would not be a good example of, intrins of an understanding of intrinsic evil. Abortion, procured abortion, not a therapeutic, you know, like an ectopic pregnancy, but a procured abortion is always wrong. Murder is always wrong. Racism is always wrong. Pope Francis, building on the teaching of Pope John Paul II, has now said for the Catholic Church, we believe that the death penalty is always wrong. And all the rest of these things are always wrong. So these are some examples of intrinsic evil. So now let's try to bring it home by making a prudential political choice in a morally complex world. Can a good Catholic vote for a Democrat, for a Republican? Can you vote for affordable health care? Can you vote for contraception, insurance coverage, so on and so forth? Because remember, when you're voting for a candidate, you're voting for a candidate. You're not voting for a referendum on one particular issue. Now I know that most of us, I grew up when TV was black and white, we didn't get a color TV, I think, until I was in high school. Uh, but black and white has certain values. It's clearer. But the world is ultimately polychromatic. It is not in black and white. And so not every moral decision in the same way is going to be black and white. Now let's go back to this thing that I talked about a second ago. When you say abortion is the preeminent issue in 2020. Well, you can understand abortion in a couple of different ways. You can understand abortion as something that trumps every other issue. That would be one way of calling it preeminent. But I think the way Pope Francis sees it, and hopefully the way the US bishops see it, is it's preeminent in the sense of being foundational or fundamental. If we do not have human life, then the rest of what we're trying to do or build upon would become ridiculous. And so you look on the right to life as absolutely foundational to everything else. So it doesn't mean a dispensation to ignore other key issues. As Pope Francis said here in his 2018 uh, exalta uh, excuse me, apostolic exhortation on uh, holiness, Gaudete and exultate, Latin for rejoice and exult. He says, defense of the unborn needs to be clear, firm, passionate, because at stake is the very dignity of human life. But equally sacred are the lives of the poor, those already born, the destitute, the abandoned, the underprivileged, victims of human traffic, slavery, every form of rejection. All of these are equally sacred because they share in that same preeminent fundamental basis of the dignity of human life. Now, people sometimes say, well, just what is, what is it that we're supposed to do? Tell me, Father, what I should do. 
Roma Lacuta, causa finita. Rome has spoken, the case is closed. Uh, and you can, Augustine said that, but it doesn't in fact usually close <laughs> too many cases. It, it gives you a good indication perhaps of what uh, the Vatican or another religious authority says, but there still is a window open to let the Holy Spirit in to give the light and the breath that God wants to give us. And so Augustine recognized that as well. Now let's look at how some people look on the current election. So we have here uh, Father Frank Pavone. He's sort of like a, a priestly free agent. He's not associated with any diocese that we know of at the moment, but he's the head of the priest for life. And he is uh, unabashedly uh, pro-Trump, not just for abortion, but he's unabashedly for uh, Donald Trump in virtually every policy uh, that Donald Trump has, has uh, enacted. And in, in his view, the Democrats are for open borders and letting criminals in and what have you. And I would just say in the interest of fairness, I don't know if any Democrat has actually said that, nor do I think any Republican has said absolutely the, the opposite. So we want to be fair in our assessment. But if you go from a priest to a bishop, we have here Bishop John Stowe, who is a, a conventional Franciscan. That's why he's in the Franciscan robes there. He's the Bishop of Lexington, Kentucky. And he has said in a webinar on July 31st and several times since in other webinars that to call the current president pro-life and back him for that reason, he would call into question that in terms of the whole commitment to the range of pro-life issues because he was saying in terms of the character of this man, he doesn't seem to be all that pro-life. And then if we go up to Pope Francis and his more recent uh, encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which is uh, brothers and sisters all, it's a phrase from some St. Francis of Assisi and he's talking about human fraternity and social uh, bond, social friendship. He says, we cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism or exclusion in any form and then say we are pro-life. So we've got a little ping pong here. Now this next slide here is looking, it's a scorecard. Now it's a slanted scorecard, I will admit, but it's saying, well, let's take a look at the different candidates and see how they come down on these different issues. And so more than whether you get in the red or the green, I think more important is to look at the left-hand side of each one of these columns and look at those concrete proposals because these are the ones that in fact will be impacted by the coming election. And we wanna make sure that we're taking sufficient recognition of the importance of these uh, different issues. Now the bishops themselves uh, have spoken in somewhat coded language, not all of the bishops, but some of the bishops. And I think it's fairly clear, you don't have to be, um, a, you know, you don't have to be a mind reader to say, I think certain bishops are coding their remarks like Bishop Stowe as being anti-Trump. And you could say, then are they pro-Biden? And other bishops are coding, like Bishop Thomas Tobin of uh, Providence, Rhode Island, are coding their message as being anti-Biden. And you might say, therefore, they are pro-Trump. Now, this isn't a complete list of bishops, but these, these men listed here, if you ask me to prove why I put them in one column or the other, I believe I could do that fairly completely using their own public messages, whether it be a, a talk or a text or a tweet. So at the end of the day, if the bishops aren't going to all agree in one candidate, that means that prudence is truly much more important. Prudence is trying to do the wisest, most loving thing. What is the wisest, most loving thing that we can do? Because love, prudence gives form to charity. Charity is love and love is God. And that is, that is a tough uh, decision to make, but that's what we have to do. 
and we should not flee from the world uh, and say, you know, I'll check back later after the election and then I'll get reinvolved in the world. It is a difficult time indeed, but I don't think we should try to uh, flee from the world. Now, some people could say, well, the Democrats aren't good and the Republicans aren't good, and so a pox on both of their houses. Can you cast a protest vote? Well, of course, you can cast a protest vote. Should you cast a protest vote? Well, that would be a prudential judgment. Would that be a good decision to make? Because I am not like a justice of the Supreme Court where I have somehow one ninth of all of the votes, but rather I'm just one person with millions of voters. So Bishop Thomas Tobin of Rhode Island said, if you can't vote for, don't vote for the Democrat. And if you can't vote for the, for the other party, well, he says, well, then write in Mother Teresa. Okay, that would clearly be a protest vote. However, I would make you know, three very basic observations. Uh, Mother Teresa being born in Albania is not eligible to run for president. Uh, she is not in fact running for president. And the main reason that she's not running for president isn't just because she was born in Albania, but because she is deaf. Uh, so while she might be a saint and she is a saint, uh, she is not a viable presidential candidate this time around. And the thing about third party votes is it is subject to the law of unintended consequences. So in 1992, when Bill Clinton was running against jo jo um, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, Ross Perot was a, was a very viable third party candidate he had no chance of winning the election, but he did succeed in drawing enough votes away from Bush to probably tip the election to Clinton in 1992. And in 2000, uh, with George W. Bush running against Al Gore, uh, Ralph Nader uh, was able to probably siphon off enough votes, especially in a key state like Florida, where it was ultimately decided by 500 votes that that tipped the election to George Bush. So we wanna be aware of, as we make our prudential uh, choice of this dynamic of unintended uh, consequences in our world. So then what then is the city of God? Well, as St. Augustine said, if you fully comprehend something, it's not God. So we recognize that we are living in what is sometimes theologians call realized eschatology. Eschatology is the end of the world. And we recognize that we are not there yet, but something of the kingdom of God is in breaking in our world today. And as St. Augustine wisely said, it's one thing to see the land of peace from a distance, from a wooded ridge. And yet it's quite another to walk the road that leads to it. So is love all that you need? Well, probably not. But if we take Augustine's famous aphorism here to heart, love, and then what it is that you want, do. That's a better translation than saying love and then do what you want. So love and what you want out of love, then do. And his final um, aphorism for today, in matters of faith, we need unity. In matters of doubt, and that's where we are right now, we need liberty, but in everything we need charity. So this brings us then to where we have to end, and that is with discernment, which involves openness to God's spirit, our own individual effort, we have to become better informed voters. It's very difficult to have low information voters. And then community discussion and dialogue, because you will see something that I don't see and vice versa. And if we can do that, then I think we will be paving the way more for our entry into the kingdom of God. And I'll leave you here with uh, some resources, uh, and I think that we're gonna make this PowerPoint presentation available afterwards so you could look these things up. So thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Father Zelsky. Um, now, should I exit that? Uh, should we exit that? The PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, Father, thank you very much for a, a, a really stimulating talk in what has been a stimulating season of uh, political discussion and debate. We have received a couple of questions that I'd like to pass on. The, the first one, um, the, the first one is from an individual who identifies himself as a John Carroll alum, who is now a Catholic deacon in the Diocese of St. Augustine, Florida. So I guess he knows something about it. The saint here, ah, yes, and that's the oldest, uh, oldest city, I think, in the United States. Uh, many of my Catholic friends, he asks, are of the opinion, based at least partly on forming consciences for faithful citizenship, that a Catholic cannot vote for Biden and call themselves Catholic. Then he says, I don't find that our clergy are trying to clarify that. Do you feel that we as clergy should clarify faithful citizenship for our parishioners? The short answer is yes. And I think that's the whole point of, or not the whole point, but a big point part of tonight's uh, presentation. If you read all of faithful citizenship, if you read the sentences to the, to the end, as I tried to show you in one graphic example, you will see the faithful citizenship highlights individual conscience, it highlights character, it highlights a range of intrinsic evils, racism being one of them, torture being another. And if Catholics are being told that you cannot vote for Biden, then they are being misinformed. Cardinal Joseph Tobin in a, a webinar that I attended was asked that explicitly. He said, can a Catholic vote for Biden? And Cardinal Tobin said, absolutely. Of course, a Catholic can vote for Tobin. And when, when Catholic priests say, when they become quite so uh, partisan to say a Catholic cannot vote for, um, for Biden or a Catholic cannot vote for Trump, then I think they are overstepping the bounds. I could say to you, you must vote for the Green Bay Packers, but I think that would be improper and also impolitic. Thank you. Um, Following on that somewhat is a, a question from another uh, alum, I believe, um, who's thanking you for your presentation and wondered if you've read the recent document from Bishop Molesic, the Bishop of the Diocese yes. of Cleveland, um, who wrote uh, in it, he cites Pope John Paul II and the document Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. And in this letter, Molesic states, but to be clear, although there are many causes our church stands for and is vocal about, the right to life must be given our paramount consideration so that people can have the chance to secure all of the benefits that life can afford. Can you comment on Bishop Molesic? Uh, well, I think I already did, but to make it, to go back and say, here's where I was commenting on that. What Bishop Molesic is, is referring to, and yes, I have read his letter. What he's referring to here is the agreement of the US bishops to label abortion as a preeminent issue. Now the bishops at their, bishops meeting where they were voting on this, there was a split. It, it was, I think, about 60-40. And in the split, 60% uh, wanted, obviously, wanted what, what, what we ended up with. Abortion is the preeminent issue. The other 40% wanted the rest of the sentence that I already showed you in that slide of Pope Francis, that equally sacred are these other things. And so to put the most positive interpretation I can on that decision of the bishops and the letter of the, the bishop here is, yes, abortion is a preeminent issue. If you understand by preeminent, foundational. If you do not have, if we do not have a foundation of respect for life and the dignity of human life, then everything else will be a, will be a castle built on sand. You can't have respect if you have respect only for fetal life, but not post fetal life, then you are not taking abortion as a preeminent issue in that sense. It's not just saying 
well, for nine months, we're going to make life sacred. But then after that, you're on your own. And that, I think, is the way that uh, it can be misinterpreted. Another question that came in uh, refers back to one of the elements of Augustine's early life that you mentioned in the early part of your presentation about his attraction to Manichaeism mm -hmm. um, and that kind of dualism of good versus bad, us versus them, black versus white, um, uh, that seems so prevalent, this person asks, in our polarized political and social world. Um, where there is, it seems as if both ends of the political spectrum are convinced that they're wearing the white hats and the other guys are wearing the black hats. How are Catholics to avoid falling into this polarization? Well, I think uh, it, it's, a, it's a temptation. As I said in the slide, it's like a virus, it's a heresy, that's like a virus that we don't have a completely effective vaccine for. So perhaps the best we can hope for is some sort of herd immunity, where if we understand what is really at stake here and understand it carefully and completely, ultimately then that poll to good guys, bad guys, white hats, black hats, might be a temptation that we can uh, set aside. But it is, it's definitely, um, it's definitely a temptation. We see it more in 2020, than in 1976, in my view. And I would also say that another possible antidote is to remember one of the points I was trying to make, which is we are not building the city of God. The city of God is not going to come into greater being uh, if you elect Donald Trump or if you elect Joseph Biden. The city of God is God's work but we can make ourselves more the citizens of the Chivitas Dei, the city of God, if we in fact love the things that God loves, if we care for the things that God cares for. And if, I didn't bring this up in my presentation, but if we can also avoid what some people will call the Constantinian curse. Constantine was the emperor who made Christianity the state religion. And that's been a blessing, but also a curse because it means, <clears throat> excuse me, that from that time to the present, Christians have tried to become dominant in the civil sphere. And this to some degree also will involve illegitimate compromises with the gospel. Maybe uh, we can have at least uh, one more question here. And this is one, um, when you have done your presentation and I've heard you speak before, one of the things that um, always strikes me is, is that you are presenting a tradition that Catholics should be very proud of. Yeah. A tradition that is rich and ancient and new, complex. And it seems to me that it, in its, in its very nature, it kind of includes um, perhaps the vaccine, and in, in other the vaccine to this to this polarization. Mm -hmm. that in other words, one can't actually practice Catholic moral theology without doing those three things on your last so slide: of thinking long and hard about issues, um, about gathering and talking as a community, which are very often the things that are not going on. Everybody's tweeting out mm -hmm. something very rapidly and often regretting it. Um, so I guess, I, I guess what I'm asking is, is that do you see your own work as a kind of uh, vocation to communicate a rich tradition that has, a, a, I mean, you work, in, you work in a university, you're in a department of theology and religious studies, but it seems as if what you're talking about is a gift that the church can present to the world that has serious practical consequences. So the short answer to your question is yes. yes <laughs> the longer answer to that question is of course, yes. Because a vaccine, you know, since we all know a lot more about vaccines, sometimes a vaccine takes just one shot. Sometimes it takes two shots. I think the vaccine that you're talking about takes many shots and a lot of lifestyle changes to help lead a life of greater health. 
And here I believe, you know, I certainly believe in the Christian tradition. I have, in fact, I've only been a Jesuit for 50 years. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get another 50, but the 50 years that I've been in, that's why I entered the Jesuits and not something, not something else. I think it is a very important. I have devoted my life trying to break open the Catholic tradition. Uh, as a moral theologian, m my main resource is not, in fact, Augustine, who was not primarily a moral theologian, but Thomas Aquinas, great 13th century theologian, died in 1274. And I think that if you understand this tradition carefully and completely, it will help us get beyond some of these obstacles of tribalism and polarization. Well, Father Paretsky, thank you very much for your thoughts this evening. We're very grateful to have you here. And I'd also like to, uh, uh, if I may, may I join you? I'd also, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank Father Bretsky, but I'd also like to um, thank the Office of Alumni Relations for assisting with this, um, for Kelly Schwabel, uh, for Mike McDonald here. Uh, we hope to have many more of these, and I look forward to the day that we're all gathered in the same room, um, sharing and thinking deep thoughts and, and, and speaking to each other uh, directly. One last thing I want to mention, there is another uh, lecture coming up on December 3rd with uh, Dr. Ed Hannenberg, um, who is the chair of our Department of Theology and Religious Studies. He is the author of a recent biography of Father Theodore M. Hesburg, the president of the University of Notre Dame for many years. Uh, and he's going to be talking about um, Hesburgh's life in the context of Catholic universities and their struggles today. We'll be sending out more information on that, but that'll be at 730 on December 3rd. I hope you can join us for that. Father Bretsky, thank you once again. Thank you. Bye-bye.